Hey, it's Michael, and I've got a question for all of us to consider this week. Can something please change? Welcome to the follow-up question. I'm your host, Michael Ashford. Come with me on a journey as I explore what it means to find common ground at a time when it feels increasingly harder to do so. To listen more than we speak so that we can understand that our differences don't have to divide us. My aim with this show is to bring you perspectives and ways of looking at issues or topics that perhaps you haven't considered before. To teach you how to ask more, better questions so that we might become more reachable as people. I'm a former journalist who believes everyone has a story to tell, and it's only when we ask questions and listen that we reveal what connects us as humans. Our dreams, our desires, our experiences, our ideas, and what we stand for rather than what we are against. I didn't plan to release this episode this week. The truth is, I was going to record this episode and it wasn't going to come out for a couple months. But then the events of the last week in our history here as this episode drops May 30th, 2022, Memorial Day here in the United States. Once I recorded this interview, I knew that it immediately had to go out to the world because of the importance of it, the significance of it. The need for us all to hear the conversation that you are about to hear in this episode, it had to happen as soon as possible. On August 10th, 1999, at six years old, Josh Stepakoff was the victim of a mass shooting. Josh was six years old, playing capture the flag at a Jewish kids summer camp when a white supremacist started shooting. At six years old, Josh was shot in the leg and the hip. Four others were injured. Another was killed. And Josh has spent the last 22 plus years not only reliving that horrific memory in his mind as best as he actually can remember, but also watching as hundreds of others in the United States have had to live and deal with the same thing. Josh has a perspective that I wish none of us had, but he has a perspective that all of us have to hear at this moment in time. After just in the last few weeks, we had the mass shooting in Buffalo and we had the horrific school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. As a parent of two children of roughly the same age as the victims in Uvalde, this last week has been brutal in a way that I cannot describe. Heart-wrenchingly painful in a way that I'll never be able to put words to. And they weren't my children. I was not directly affected by this. I don't have that context and I hope to God that I never will. But Josh has a perspective that we have to listen to because it is rare in these instances and they happen far too often that someone does come out alive with a perspective and a story to tell in ways that can actually move the conversation forward rather than just devolve into arguments, the same arguments over and over again. If we are to listen to anyone, shouldn't it start with people like Josh? That is my entire goal with this conversation that you are about to hear. I want you to listen to how a six-year-old child copes with a mass shooting and then has to live for 20 plus years after that, seeing nothing change. 
folks, our arguments haven't changed. The blaming and finger pointing hasn't changed. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And shouldn't something change? Are you willing to listen to a perspective like Josh's and concede or admit that total victory is not necessary as long as something changes here? Whatever total victory looks like in your mind, are you willing to set that aside to hear the other side and to engage in reasonable, logical, nuanced discussion so that something can change? And I'm not even talking about at the national level. Honestly, I've given up a lot of hope that nationally this conversation can move forward. So how are you going to change in your conversations, in the stuff you post on social media, in the ways that you show up in your community to actually get stuff done? How are you going to change? Because something has to change. Where does your mind go in in times like this that we're dealing with right now? We're recording this three days out from the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, just to put it in context for everyone listening. Where does your mind go when these things happen? It's There's so many things that go through my mind and it, it kind of changes depending on where I've been in my life. But like right now going, hearing the news about the shooting in Texas, um, first I thought about not to sound selfish, but first I thought about myself. Um, and then, you know, I, my wife and I have been having a ton of talks about where we're going to start sending our daughter to school. She's not even two yet. And so all of a sudden I had this, you know, complete breakdown of like, am I being a responsible parent by sending my kid to school? And what kind of thought is that to have? Mm -hmm. And once I processed all of that and, and really there is no processing that, but once I, you know, got past that, that's when not only the, the anger sets in, the heartbreak sets in. I know what these kids are in for, for the rest of their life. The ones who were not murdered. I know what they have to look at for the rest of their life. And that's not a life that I want to imagine for anyone. Um, So, you know, for me, it's what immediately comes to my head is just, Like, I wish that I could provide answers, but there are no answers. This is a senseless shooting again, time and time again. And this is where the the anger picks up, right? Like, you know, I I want to so badly be, you know, fully engulf myself in the healing process that's going to happen for these families. Um, But I just get so pissed off because... (laughs) We see this over and over and over and over and over again, and nothing happens from it. And, and it's just frustrating. You know, I've been doing this for 20, over 20 years. And, you know, it's not the first time I've had this conversation, unfortunately. But uh, to know how many incredibly strong, common sense pieces of gun legislation have been killed by our government. And in, in turn, we see the loss of human life time and time again, because they're not willing to have the spine to stand up and do the right thing. They continue to pander to the minority in terms of gun legislation. And we're seeing the effects of that. And our children are seeing the effects of that in, you know, just to, to put it in a, a bigger picture like yeah we had Uvalde Texas which was absolutely awful a couple of days ago we had the shooting in Buffalo um not even I think just about two weeks ago now Mm -hmm. uh a shooting in a church that killed 
multiple people and are injured multiple people. These things happen every single day. There's been over 230 something mass shootings already in 2022. We're in May. And a mass shooting constant is is defined as a shooting where four or more people are shot. Right? We're in May and we have already surpassed the number of days in the year with mass shootings. And it's just disgust. I mean, they're like, you know, I can go on and on, but it's there's truly no words to describe the frustration, the sadness, and how much I wish I could provide help and answers to those families. But the truth is like everyone's going to have their own healing journey and, and it's going to be a lifelong thing, right? Like I can provide some insight, but I can't tell you how your life's going to end up. And there's so many different ways that it can go. And, um, and it's, it's not, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. And <sighs> Oh, well, I was just going to say also to put it in context, like we're having this conversation right now and we did not plan this discussion after the shooting in Uvalde happened, but that just goes to show how frequent this happens. Like we planned this, you know, a long time ago and here we are talking about the, the topic of gun violence and we have multiple prime examples of how we're not doing anything to fix it in this country uh, that just kind of happened. I mean, it's not even a coincidence at this point. Like it's almost a guarantee that it's going to happen every single week. Mm, sobering way to open, man. Um, <laughs> let's, yeah, you know, let's open on a good note, right? But uh, hopefully we get there. Um, <laughs> it's a little, it's a little hard to see through the darkness right now. Something you said though, struck me and I want to know what you mean, meant by it. You said, I know what the kids who, who are survivors, I know what they're seeing and what they will see for the rest of their lives. Something to that effect. I don't know if I'm using your exact mm -hmm. phrasing, but what did you mean by that, Josh? We always, you know, obviously everyone handles with tragedy in different ways and, and part of my way to deal with it is to um try and make light of as much as i can right and to try and joke around and that's not at all what i'm doing here but follow me um we used to joke around that getting shot was this you know elite group that you never wanted to be a part of but once you were in it like nobody else can relate to you unless unless you've been initiated into that club right like not you know obviously trying to make a little bit of light out of the situation but also when you look deeper like it's a really um it's not a, a it's not a good thing like it's it's messed up and nobody will understand what it is that we have gone through until they have gone through it themselves. Like I can look at you and I can tell you that I'm freaked out, you know, because I think somebody is going to pop out of my trash can with an AR-15 to try and kill me. And that sounds absolutely ridiculous to the general public. But if I'm talking to somebody who's, you know, survived a, a shooting before, that sounds totally logical. And they're like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I get that. I've had similar thoughts, right? So you know, a long answer to a simple question is that by me saying that I, I know what's to come for them. And I say that because only people who have survived something like this will understand something like this and understand where, um, or, or what kind of thoughts you're going to have and however irrational they might seem to, to everyone else. It's complete reality to me. So, you know, I know the sadness they're going to feel, the guilt they're going to feel, the anger they're going to feel, all of these different emotions that they're going to have. And it's going to be something where, you know, you're going to look around and you're saying, you don't, there's no way for you to understand what I'm going through. But there are people out there such as myself and, and other survivors of mass shootings who do understand it. And so that's what I mean when I say, you know, I know what's to come for them. Um, I know the struggles they're going to have, and obviously it's going to be different for everybody. 
right? You know, everyone's gonna everyone's gonna heal in different ways. Um, and to some extent, you'll never fully heal, right? It's, this is now a part of who you are. Um, so I just know what that looks like because I've lived it. Of those emotions that you just listed off, which one has stuck with you the longest? Which, which one continues to rear its head? if that's an appropriate way to say it. Um, yeah. 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 Which, which one do you deal with? I guess the most frequently anxiety, a lot of anxiety. Um, and I've gone through years and years and years of treatments, different styles of treatments. And, you know, it's all around, there was two things. There was one was anxiety and that was a huge focus of therapy for me. And another one was trying to fill in the gaps of my memory, right? So like part of our, part of the way our body works is that when we experience trauma, our brain can black it out, right? And you have no memory of what happened. So I had gaps in my memory. And so I would spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours recounting every second of that day, trying to fill in those gaps, right? Like I wanted to know what happened. I wanted to remember what I was thinking, how I knew to get up and run in the other direction and how I did that. Did I, did I know that I had been shot? Did I know that, um, that I had a broken leg? You know, what, what was going through my mind? And, And part of that, as I later realized was kind of me trying to understand like, okay, if I found myself in this situation again, could I, save myself again. Right. Like I, I I got lucky once. Uh, Will my body's natural response save me again? And that's what I wanted to know and what I wanted to understand. So those were the two things that really stuck with me. Um, and, and, you know, I, at this point, what truly and honestly sticks around the longest is, is anxiety. And, um, you know, and, and in a different way, there's a lot of pressure, right? That, you know, I survived this for a reason. Like I'm, I got to do something with it. So, you know, so those would probably be the two things for me that I, I find most not overwhelming, but you know, that, that are the longest lasting effects. Josh, you were six when you were shot at, at camp, what was, what were the emotions right after? Um, did the, did the anxiety set in almost immediately or did that take time? Just, I don't understand where a six year old's head goes in the moments after being shot by a white supremacist at camp. Like, yeah. What, what was Uh, that? It had to have been a roller coaster. You know, like I said, I, some of it I, I don't remember, right? To be completely honest, after years and hours of trying to remember what happened, uh, there's still a large chunk of that morning that I don't remember. But when when things settled down, um, the anxiety, uh, you know, whether anxiety is the right word, I don't even know, but just I was very jumpy, right? Like anything would would cause a panic. And, um, whether that led to a panic attack kind of depended on, on where I was that day and and where my head was at. But if I heard sirens, helicopters, if I saw police officers or firefighters, those were all triggers, right? Um, if I heard loud noises, I was startled by pretty much anything and everything. Uh, you know, if, if a door slammed, if a car backfired, didn't matter what it was. Um, so all of that, you know, kind of led to, and, and that started pretty instantaneously and that led to the anxiety that I would cope with for the next now going on 22 years. Um, but like I said, it, it always kind of changed depending on where I was, where I was at in my life and my development and what was going on around me. But at, at six years old, 
you know, I, I didn't go to the movies. I didn't, I didn't really like sleeping over at friends' houses. I didn't literally, if I heard helicopters, sirens, any of those things that I listed off before the house went on lockdown. I didn't care where you had to go. What was going on in your life? (laughs) Sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. Sorry to my brother. Like doors were locked. Blinds were down. Windows were locked, you know, everything. Um, And we just kind of had to wait until I worked through it, you know? So uh, it took a lot of adjusting, not only for myself, but for my family. And I was very fortunate that they were supportive, but there, yeah. I mean, to go back to the original question, I don't know that I fully came to grips with what happened immediately. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like these, these symptoms that I'm describing, this, they came along at some point. I don't know exactly when I could pinpoint it, but, um, you know, I, w- I wasn't sitting there in the hospital bed freaking out. I was probably too, uh, I was too distracted to even think about that kind of stuff, but I knew what had happened. Um, but I don't think I knew, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the scope of what had happened, that I was targeted because I was Jewish, that I had literally done nothing wrong, that this wasn't something that everyone else experienced. And it wasn't till those things start to set in that that's when, you know, that's when things started to change. Cause all of a sudden I realized that I'm not like everyone else. I want to explore something you brought up earlier and you kind of dove into it a little bit, Josh, but wanting to remember that day, I think a lot of people would listen to your story and say, what? Why? And and Forget you all of it. Yeah, and you you talked about, you know, gosh, the the forethought of thinking if I'm ever in that situation again, what would I do differently or could I escape again? Was that the like yeah, I hate asking just the, the simple question, why yeah. Josh, but why want no, to why. remember the details of something like this? I mean, it, it makes sense when you take a step back and you think about the fact that I was in the place where I was supposed to be with the people I was supposed to be with doing the things I was supposed to do. I was, you know, I wasn't in some shady area doing sketchy things. Like I was, I was at summer, a Jewish summer camp, you know, a day camp because my parents both work full time and I, I was having the time of my life. And so for me, the thought of getting shot, can literally happen anywhere. And we're now, you know, obviously this was back in 1999 and this didn't happen every single day. Um, So, you know, as, as I'm processing this as a young kid, it's like, okay, how do I restore my faith and my trust in the world if this can literally happen anywhere? Right. And so I address that question and there is no, there's no way to confidently tell myself, yeah, you're safe again. There's just, that's not the case. I now know that it can happen anywhere. So what's my next plan of action? And, and, you know, I'm, as you're probably starting to tell here, I'm a very logical and rational person, right? So, okay, if plan A is that I can't, I can't tell myself that I'm safe, literally anywhere. What's the next thing I can do? And the next thing I can do is make sure that when I find myself in that situation, will I know what to do. And so that was for me, the thought process and, and of, of why I wanted to understand what was going on. Um, but also early on, I just wanted to like, and this is a hard thing for people to understand, but the one thing in life that we have control over is ourselves, right? The only thing that we know totally what's going on with is ourselves. And to all of a sudden have this major thing happen to you, a life altering thing happen to you and you have no recollection of it. It's aggravating. It's so frustrating. You just want to know what happened to you almost, right? Like 
what was going through my head? What did I see? What didn't I see? What did I feel? I literally know nothing. I don't remember any of it. I have one dream that I had where I, where I, you know, could understand and put into the words, put into words the feeling of an actual bullet piercing through my body. But I don't even know if that's reality because it was a dream. Mm -hmm. So was that actually what I felt or, or was it just, you know, my mind telling me what I wanted to hear, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just this constant uncertainty of what was going on is aggravating because it's something that defined my life. Like you and I are sitting here talking because of this one thing that happened yeah. and the, um, the countless conversations and people I've met because this happened to me and yet I don't even remember it. So that was that, that ultimate frustration is what led me to, to try <laughs> everything I could think of to try and, and fill those gaps in my memory. Um, you know, because if I, once again, if I also think about it in the logical sense, if I look at where I was standing and where the shooter was, based on where the bullets entered my body, it would almost seem as though I was turning and running in the other direction before the bullets hit me. You know, I wasn't fully, uh, my back wasn't to him, but it was almost my side was to him. Or was that just, you know, the way that he was shooting? I don't know. And so I, you know, I want to know well, what was, what was happening? Was I, you know, where, almost in like a terrible way to say it, where could I improve, right? Like, what could I have done differently? Mm. Would there have been a different outcome if I did something differently? Could I have helped anybody else? Like, you just don't know. And it's, it's so frustrating. There's no, like, there's no word strong enough to, to describe it. Like, it's just, it, it's a, you know, it's a, and it's a hard one to to try and describe to other people because it's not something that a lot of people understand. And that's once again where, you know, where I say, like, I know what's some of the struggles these families are going to have, right? Um, because once again, that's a, it's a hard concept for people to understand, which is why you brought up the question to begin with. Right? Like why? Why would you want to remember the worst moments of your life? I can sense the frustration, for <laughs> sure, and it's it's both heartbreaking and and chilling, Josh, to hear you even say. And I don't know if you consciously did this, but you said when this happens again, and that's it's heartbreaking, man. That's that's heartbreaking. That I don't know if you said that intentionally, but. <sighs> Gosh, based on based on experience after. and what we're seeing, is that more likely? I mean, I and but that's the reality that I live yeah. in, right? Yeah. Like, like to me, you know, to 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 most people, and I hope most people don't share that view. And most people will say that it's not that case. But in my head, in my reality, there is nothing stopping it from happening again to me, Josh. At this how, point in time, there's nothing. Yeah. How, how do you deal with those questions, the, those doubts, the questions that you brought up? How do you do with, deal with the questions in your mind of why did it happen to me? And, and, you know, what could I have done better, like you said, or could I have helped or even, you know, is it going to happen again? How do you not spiral? I have spiraled, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that's, and, and you hear, we're all, familiar with the the term snowball effect right like and it happens you know i i can remember very vividly times where like i'll just i'll be walking outside at night it's dark on a quiet street and i think to myself i should be freaked out right now why aren't i freaked out right now and then i start to freak out and then i'm like wait a minute i'm in a you know a safe place there's nothing wrong. There's no reason to freak out. And it just snowballs, right? And it would grow into this massive panic attack all because I had the thought, like, why aren't I freaking out right now? A normal person would freak out right now. But then I start freaking out. I'm like, this isn't a normal reaction. And and so there is the spiral all the time. And that's just something that I've learned to deal with. You know, that's part of my reality. But the other part of it is that 
you know, a lot of the answer to these questions is, is uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I could have helped anybody else. I don't know if it's going to happen again. I don't know a lot of things. And as, as I came to the reality of that, that's when I was able to kind of reconcile those questions and just kind of understand, like, look, I've tried, you know, I, I tried so hard to answer those questions for a long time. And I finally got to the point where I just don't know, plain and simple. And I'm not going to beat myself up over things that I don't know the answer to. I'm going to keep, keep working at it, but I'm not going to let it consume me. Um, and what's done is done, right? So like, could I have helped people? I don't know. And if I could have, there's literally nothing I can do about it at this point. So I can't let that stand in the way of me moving forward because otherwise it'll be debilitating and I'll never get to, you know, as, as I kind of said before, like I survived this for a reason, right? Um, that's one way to look at it. And the other way to look at it is, is life is short, right? <laughs> enjoy every moment. So how can I enjoy myself and, and move forward with my life and live my life in a positive way if I'm so caught up in the past? So I have to accept the parts of the past that I can't change that have happened, take those things, tie it up in a pretty little bow and move on forward with my life in the most positive way possible. I want to ask you a hypothetical. Sure. Um, and I don't typically ask hypotheticals, but you're as good a person to ask a hypothetical to as possible. Um, mental health is an enormous part of this discussion uh, that that we're seeing right now. There's there's almost two camps. It's a mental health issue and it's a gun, you know, access issue. You have talked about the fact that you had access to and, and went through years of help and therapy to deal with what you saw and what you experienced hypothetically josh what would have happened to you had you not had access to those resources that's a i've never gotten that one before hmm. that's a good question um i don't know Obviously, I don't know, um, but the, the the true answer, um, my understanding and my experience in therapy is not necessarily that the person sitting across from me has all the answers. Um, what they're doing and what a therapist's job is, is for you to look internally and their, their job is to prompt you with different questions and different scenarios and different tools to help you cope with with what's going on in in your thought process and so for me i view mental i, I view therapy as a tool that was extremely helpful for me and, and i'm grateful that i had it but i think the the probably unpopular answer to that question in my case right um, cause this isn't going to be true for everyone, but for me, I'm fairly confident in the fact that I wouldn't have had problems with the trajectory of my life had I not gone to therapy and I would have continued to fight to bring, to, to kind of bring my life back on track. Right. I struggled with a lot of anxiety. I struggled with a lot of different issues. PTSD, um, and those issues are still prevalent, and I treated them in many different ways. But you have to remember that you know while my my biggest breakthroughs were probably eighteen to twenty years after the shooting happened. So I lived a long time dealing and coping with those uh, those symptoms, and the onset of those symptoms was so early on in my life 
that I learned that to be my norm, right? Mm -hmm. This was the life that I lived. I was used to it. While I was unhappy with it, I knew how to cope with it myself. It wasn't something that anyone taught me. It was, and, and that begs a different question of, of resilience, right? And that's why I say my answer is going to be different than somebody else's. Because everyone deals with trauma in different ways. And I am very grateful that I, I don't know where this resilience came from. But ultimately, deep down, therapy is not going to do anything if you're not willing to put in the work. And I feel very confident saying that I would have put in the work with or without therapy to improve my life in as many ways as possible. Um, so while it was a resource that I think accelerated my ability to to you know, improve the quality of my life, I think I would have gotten there either way. And I also, you know, while I struggled with a lot of different things, I think it's important to note that I was generally an overall a fun loving and happy and resilient child, right? Like it. So the parts of my life that I was unhappy with were not something that most people saw because I did a really good job of hiding it um, because I had to, because I looked like no offense. I looked like a, a lunatic. If I'm running around at seven years old, having these panic attacks about shooters, right? Like that wasn't our norm in 1999 and in 2000 that wasn't normal so i almost out of like self-preservation had to learn how to hide a lot of the symptoms that i was feeling and in doing so learned how to cope with those feelings whether in a healthy or unhealthy way i don't know but you know that's that's the hard part about trauma is that it, it sets in in so many different ways right it can be life altering. It could be a, a blink of an eye. You don't really know, you know, and it just kind of depends on, on who you are. And hmm. it, yeah, it's just, it's, it's something that, and this is part of once again, like what I wish people knew, like it's not going to go away. It's never going to go away. It's always part of who you are. So it's just kind of how you address it, what you choose to do with it. And it took me a long time to get there. And it sounds like an arrogant and kind of an asshole thing to say, but it's up to you. You've got to, you know, you, you have a choice to make. And it's not the easy choice. Um, but choosing your happiness and working through that does take a little bit of selfishness but you have to you just it's it's survival man again it's gut-wrenching to hear that a seven-year-old would have to come to those decisions to hide their pain and i think of my nine-year-old daughter and my my 11 almost 12 year old son and just my heart breaks for you for them for for all the kids dealing with this man um I want to talk about well, your so parents. So I flip it back on. Yeah, get, I flip it back on you. Like you know, what? How do you feel as a parent huh. sitting here watching these things happen, and and how do you have that conversation with your kids who are nine and eleven? Which unfortunately we would think like, oh, that's way too young to be talking about this, but they see it. They know what's happening. How do you deal with that? <sighs> you know, this is the reality we live in, and and it's in particular difficult because the students in Uvalde were the same age, right? Um, I don't have a clear, I don't have an easy answer, man. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to ask you about your parents. Cause I want to know how they talk to you about it. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Cause one of the things that I've heard and that I've, I found myself agreeing with is I can't look at them and tell them that it's never going to happen. And that is, I keep using the the term gut wrenching, but my my heart physically wrenches that I, as their father, can't give them that assurance. Yeah, uh, and and you know, you said you had a two year old. You're you're talking about or thinking about school. Um, so you have a you have a new perspective of it, even after all these years. 
you now have an added layer of perspective on it that so, so few of us, but unfortunately too many of us are starting to have. Uh, to answer your question, <laughs> it is it is just, this is my way of trying to figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. To there, there's a, there's this dichotomy that I feel of anger and rage and, and hurt and pain while also trying to understand and empathize and find, I just posted about this, find a different way to have this conversation where we're not doing the same thing over and over again, where one sign clearly that's not working. It's not. And it hasn't for 20 plus years. Like I was a high schooler when yeah. Columbine happened. And the thing, the only thing that happened was we banned Marilyn Manson in black trench coats. <laughs> like that was our solution. <laughs> I distinctly remember yeah. Marilyn Manson wasn't allowed in school anymore. And black trench coats weren't allowed in school anymore. And I'm sitting there as a high school sophomore, like what? Okay. But the, what about the real issue? Exactly. Like, okay, but <laughs> it's exactly the question that goes through, uh, I think, all of our minds. That was the genius solution you could come right? up with. I mean, it's just, but but there has to be, so we have to do things differently because we keep having the same conversation and nothing changes. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And But the tactics that we're using to have this conversation haven't worked for 20 plus years now. So how do we do something yeah. different? And I want your perspective on that, Josh, because you've got a different perspective than, than most of us do, obviously, on this. I do want to ask you, and I want to come back to that, I do want to ask you, your parents, what did they tell you? Because I'm at a loss. I know a lot of other parents are at a loss even to what to say yeah. now. So, I mean, for the first time really experiencing a major school shooting as a parent, right? I'm looking at this and, and this is something that I've said for a long time. I know that my anxiety and my PTSD is going to shift with every stage of my life, right? Like I know I can be in a good spot now, but the goalpost is always moving, right? As, as I'm in a different place, things are going to change. And here I find myself now as a parent, um, looking at this from a totally different perspective. And I remember uh, just uh, on whatever day it was, on Tuesday when this happened, I texted my mom and I just said, I don't know how you had the strength to send us back to the JCC because I can't even stomach the thought of like sending her to school right now. And she's not even in school yet her being my daughter my parents you know they they said this for a multitude of different things there is no playbook right there is no right way to deal with this there's no pamphlet at the doctor's office of your kid got shot hmm. now what right like hmm. there is that, that's not a thing and everyone has to to handle it in the right way for their family. And, and I, to this day, you know, that first part of the text of my mom stands true. I don't know how they have the strength to, to do any of what they did. They, you know, immediately found therapy for me, whether it was, you know, too soon or not soon enough, who knows? Um, they immediately found therapy and, we took it one day at a time. It was a learning process for the whole family. Nobody knew what to do. Uh, so they, they were just as lost as the rest of us. And there, you know, at the time, this was a major international thing, right? Um, and to put it into perspective, there were three, four kids shot. And I'll, I'll count the 16 year old counselor as a kid. So there's four kids shot. A receptionist in her 60s was shot. And uh, a mailman was killed. Right. So we had one death, and that was international news. And now it might make a headline in a local newspaper. 
So to put that in, in that perspective of what my parents were dealing with at the time was an international news phenomenon. Um, you know, so they're trying to shield me from all the interview requests and the cameras and let me just be a kid. And yet at the same time, they're doing press conferences. They immediately dove in, dove into advocacy work. Um, you know, but none of that involved me. They did their own thing. And when they came home, it was, we don't have to talk about the shooting unless you want to, right? Like, and that was always kind of the thing. If, if, if I wanted to talk about it, they were there for me. And I, they wanted to know that, that I could talk about it anytime. But if I didn't want to, if I wasn't comfortable talking about it, okay, conversation over, let's talk about something else. Um, so there was just that continuous unconditional support. Um, and I think that's really the only thing you can do, right? You don't want to bombard them. You don't want to make a bigger deal out of it than they're making. And, and I, we always talked about this in school, um, which we haven't even gotten into that, but I, studied psychology and ended up getting a master's degree in clinical psychology with the emphasis in marriage and family therapy, all because I kind of had this in my background. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we always talked about was you got to meet them where they're at. Right. So if I'm coming at this, if, if this happened to my child and I'm coming at it from a totally different perspective, I could be exacerbating the situation instead of helping it. Right. So you have to you have to meet them where they're at, see what, what their thoughts are on it. And if that just means one 10 minute conversation, especially with a nine or eleven year old, they might, you know, they might not want to talk for that that long about it. Or it might be an ongoing conversation that they want to continue to bring up and they might want to get involved and, and they might want to um, take on advocacy work or or you know, send letters to to their congressional or senate representatives. Like it just kind of depends on the kid and you have to, you have to know your children and, and the people in your family um, to try and figure out the best way to do that. But I, you know, in my family and what worked best for us was that, like I said, that unconditional support was incredible. If I was having a bad day and I wanted to talk about it, I could talk about it. And I always knew that, but they weren't going to force it on me. They weren't going to make me talk about it if I didn't want to talk about it. It was always my choice. And in a time when I had lost every sense of personal control over my life, that was nice to have that back in, one, in at least one sense, in one facet, right? Yeah. Like here I am coping with something that I had zero control over. So it was nice to have that option again to be in the driver's seat. Josh, what do you want to see happen? In an ideal world? Let's go there. What the fuck do we need guns for? Truly and honestly, what do we need them for? We live in a civilized society. There is no other country that deals with this on the scale that we deal with this. We have more firearms than we have people. Why? Clearly, if they were keeping us safer, we would be the safest country in the world. If a good guy with a gun was keeping us safer, we would be the safest country in the world because there are far too many good guys with guns. But why is it that an 18-year-old can go buy an AR-15 and hundreds, if not thousands of rounds of ammunition? Why should anybody be able to buy thousands of rounds of ammunition? What do you need that for? I don't get it. It just makes no sense to me. So in an ideal world, the only people who need guns is law enforcement and even they shouldn't need them that much because the rest of us wouldn't have them right if you need them for hunting you don't need an ar-15 plain and simple if you do you suck at hunting <laughs> like it just so an ideal world no guns in the reality of, of 2022 in the world that we're in let's make it a lot harder right Let's let's require background checks for every single firearm purchase. Get rid of the gun show loophole. 
Let's put a cap on how much ammunition you can buy. Let's put a cap on the size of magazines that you can own. Let's take a look at it in a different sense. Let's look at the financial cost, right? You got a gun in the home? That's an insurance premium. Just like if you have a diving board or if you have a dog that the insurance companies deem a risk. Why are we not looking at guns the same way? What do you have to do to drive your car? You have to go sit and spend, you know, how many hours behind the wheel with a trained instructor, then additional hours with a parent, then you have to take tests, and then you have to insure it every single year. And they judge you based on your performance. Let's treat guns the same way, right? And all of a sudden, it's going to get pretty costly for you to have a firearm. And that's going to take away a lot of the people who have it just in case. You know, we're going to we're going to start seeing some some change there. So ultimately, it just needs to be a lot harder. Let's treat it like an abortion. You got to go to a doctor. You have to wait, you know, 48 hours or however long it takes. You have to see a psychologist, get a mental health exam. And then you can go through with it. Let's do the same thing. If you want to take away my kid's right to live because you're too afraid to stand up to the NRA and the gun gun industry. But you you have a problem with abortions. I don't see how you can reconcile those two because you're doing the same thing just at a different point in their life. So once we start treating guns as the lethal human killing machines that they are, we will see a change. But we're not willing to do that as a country. We see them as a way of life and we see them, you know, fetishized them. They're, you know, people pose for family photos with all their guns as a bragging right. All these political commercials with firearms in them as though it's a point of pride. What are you making up for? Like, put that, put it away. You don't need that. You know, it's, it's, it's literally call it what it is. They have no purpose other than to kill. When was the last time you heard about a mass stabbing at a school? You don't. Because by the time they stab one person, somebody's knocked them out. They've tackled them, taken the knife away, whatever it is, right? This is not commonplace yet. I can walk into anywhere with a hundred round magazine and blast off a hundred bullets into people. Why is that okay? Why is that the world that we're living in where that is acceptable? So until we do something and look at this in a way that is not driven by money and a, and a, a cling to power, we're not going to see any solution. But we should be treating these like we treat every other life threatening machine josh what's a what's a question that you wish you were asked more (sighs) question that i wish i was asked more probably that one that's a good question (laughs) (laughs) um i mean a lot of the fun, to be honest, a lot of what has helped me heal so much in, in sharing my story is the questions that I get that I wasn't expecting, right? And so like, how can I, I, I don't know what question is going to make me think about my life in a different way the next time, you know, the next conversation I have, I, I talk with people all over the country, all over the world, and I get different perspectives and their questions always kind of prompt me to think about things in a different way. Um, so You know, it's hard for me to answer that question, but I think, I think probably the best question that I wish people focus on a little bit more um, was, was not about the, not about the shooting itself, but the healing, right? What did that process look like? Because so uh, we have shootings, like I said, every single day. Hundreds and thousands of people are coping with life after a shooting. And some people are going to be totally fine. 
and some are going to struggle a lot. And unfortunately, our society turns its back on those people, right? We live in a news cycle world. A couple weeks from now, nobody's going to be talking about it. You know, the shooting in Uvalde happened in 10 days prior was the shooting in Buffalo. And I remember I, we were, as the news was breaking and I was talking to somebody in my office and they were like, yeah, wasn't it like a month ago that that shooting in Buffalo happened? Mm. That's how fast our news cycle is, right? It hadn't even been two weeks mm. and we had already moved on in in our life and in our world and forgotten that it that these people probably haven't even stopped crying yet from the tragedy and the horror that they just saw unfold, let alone starting to to focus on the new reality that is their life. Right. So for me, I think so many people neglect the very, very long road to recovery that is ahead for not just the people who are at the school for their family members, their cousins, their aunts, their uncles, their parents, their, for the ones who survived and for the ones who were murdered. Um, the staff of the people working at that school, people at other schools are all going to be feeling uh, a similar sense of, of, you know, lack of safety. Right. So this one shooting is going to affect tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And we as a country are turning our back and instead we're going to, you know, it's going to be a question at a debate, a political debate. Nothing's going to happen. And these families are still left to fend for themselves and try and improve their lives. And all we can talk about is how to react to something like this instead of how to prevent something like this. Right. Um, so I, I think the, to get back to the, the question, I, I, I wish people would ask me more about the healing process, the different resources that are out there. Um, and what kind of things you can do to begin to move on and begin to to accept the new reality that is your life. Well, Josh, um, thank you so much for sharing what your process has been like. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, real quick, we've got three minutes left here. <laughs> um, what point? Point me to a resource or two that I can link in the show notes, um, as you just said, where where folks can go if they want to learn more. Um, I'll point you to a couple different places. Uh, I serve on the board of directors for an incredible organization here in Los Angeles called Women Against Gun Violence. Uh, their website is wagv.org. And, you know, a lot of times the frustration with these organizations is that, you know, you donate money, but they don't really provide you with anything to do or, you know, any ways that you can help. And, and that's one of the things that I actually love against about Women Against Gun Violence is our only correspondence with our people um, is with concrete action, things you can do, uh, letters you can send, numbers for people to call. And we're not just going to hit you up for donations every week or every time there's a mass shooting, we provide you with, um, with a, a, a solid list of things that you can do. And that's our communication with you. It's not just always begging for money. We also work heavily with the school districts, uh, in Los Angeles to <clears throat> both private and public to distribute materials on safe gun storage. Cause once again, we are a common sense, uh, common sense organization and we fully understand that we're not going to get people to give up their guns but if you're going to keep them in the home let's talk about how we can store them safely um, so you know that's we work with with school districts and we're always looking to expand and and you know in different states and different counties wherever um, we're looking to partner with just the average person we are truly grassroots we're a very small organization um, and we look to partner with the same uh, anywhere and everywhere. Um, so women against gun violence, an incredible organization. We give you concrete stuff to do. We will pre-write things for you to send. Right. Um, and we'll, we call it a, a, an action alert and that's what we send you. 
And it's truly that. It's, hey, here's what's going on. Here's a way that you can take action. And this is going on more often than people think, right? Yeah. There's different pieces of legislation and different chambers and, uh, and different you know, security councils and this and that. And it's all over the place. So we keep an eye on that for you. And we let you know when there's something that you can do. Um, if you're looking for mental health resources, um, you know, it varies from state to state, but there's all sorts of different organizations out there that will help with different, uh, different income levels. And, and, you know, there's a lot of government, government options out there and private insurance options out there. You know, the first, first thing you can do is just start calling around and and talk to the therapists in your area. And if they don't have, um, you know, if they're not taking new clients, see if they know somebody who is, and you just kind of, you have to put in the work, you know, it's, there's not, and, and that's the unfortunate part in today's world is that there isn't, you know, a very easy to read way to find these resources. It's still kind of hard. So, um, you got to put in a little bit of work, but as soon as you make those phone calls, I guarantee you that every therapist you talk to is going to help find somebody for you, even if they're not the right fit. Right. So, um, but other than that, talking to local, local officials, offices, they'll have different resources for you know, different victims assistance programs and things like that that can help. Josh, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time, man. Thank you. And, uh, best wishes to you and let's stay in touch. All right. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So many thanks to Josh for taking the time to share his story here on the show. Please do me and Josh an enormous favor. Share this episode and Josh's perspective with someone, anyone, you know, who might find some value in listening to today's conversation, no matter where they fall on the issue and the debate about gun safety. Share this episode with your network. Help spread the good word about the importance of asking more questions. And if you like the conversations with the amazing guests like Josh that I have on each and every episode, subscribe so that you never miss when a new episode drops. If you ever want to get in touch with me, you can always email me at michael at the follow-up question.com or go to michaelashford.com and reach out there. I'll catch you on the next episode of the follow-up question. And until then, keep asking questions.